Okay, calm down, okay? Okay, why did you do that? That was the 911 recording of Jonathan Schmitz, just after gunning down his secret admirer, Scott Amager. And not just any secret admirer, but one who would become known to him in the most public ways possible. A way that some say led them both to this point. Welcome back to Crime A to Z, where we detail cases and criminals from their very beginnings until well after other reporting ends. Today we'll be talking about a high-profile case from the 1990s, born out of the era of shock television. The murder of Scott Amager. The murder took place just days after the controversial taping of The Jenny Jones Show, a nationwide television talk show in the U.S. The episode sparked a national debate over the harmful and even deadly effects of tabloid television in the United States, and whether the shows bear any responsibility. Join us as we explore the details behind the headlines that most people weren't even aware of. In the 1990s, daytime talk shows were at their prime. At one point, there were 16 of them on the air, and the competition for ratings was fierce. Producers needed ways to stand out from the crowd and get noticed. Confrontation was the answer. Enter tabloid television, also dubbed shock television, where real-life conflict was king. The main objective was to make the topics and the guests as sensational as possible to keep audiences coming back for more. Secrets were revealed, confessions made, confrontations initiated. The more confrontational, the more salacious, the more scandalous, the better. If the drama was high, so were ratings. And, of course, earnings for the station. There really were no boundaries. Until one episode turned deadly. In 1995, the Jenny Jones Show put out a request inviting anyone with a secret crush on a same-sex friend to contact the show. If you have a, fan, uh, a secret crush on someone of the same sex and want to do it here on the show and reveal your crush, yeah. call us at the show. 32-year-old Scott Amager, a daytime talk show enthusiast, is interested. Having grown up in Lake Orion, Michigan, Scott was a bartender who had spent four years in the Army, where he came out as gay. By his friends' accounts, Scott was a kind and generous person. They did acknowledge that he was no angel. He had a drug problem, had been charged with assault a couple of times, was unemployed, and pretty heavily in debt. Scott contacts the show and shares that he has a crush on a friend of his, 24-year-old Jonathan Schmitz. Jonathan Schmitz was born and raised in Michigan as well, and worked at a local restaurant called The Fox and Hounds. He had a history of manic behavior, and had never been in trouble with the law. Having hunted with his father, he knew how to handle a gun. The Jenny Jones Show responds to Scott. They're interested in having him on the show. He agrees, and immediately calls he and Jonathan's mutual friend Donna Riley to share the news and ask her to come on the show with him. Donna and Scott don't expect that any harm will come from the encounter, given that Jonathan doesn't have any issues with Scott and has always been friendly toward him. A producer from the Jenny Jones show contacts Jonathan and explains that a mystery person has a crush on him. They invite Jonathan to come on the show for the reveal. According to a spokesman for the show, Jonathan was told that his secret admirer could be either a woman or a man. At some point, Jonathan expressed that he did not want to participate if it was a man, and asked which it is. The show insisted they weren't allowed to divulge, but Jonathan claims that they led him to believe that he had nothing to worry about. Almost immediately, Jonathan starts having suspicions that Donna and Scott are somehow involved. So he asked them if they'll be in Chicago where the show was being taped around the time of the taping to see what they say. 
To protect the element of surprise, Donna and Scott insist that they know nothing. So Jonathan then speculates that the secret crush is likely his longtime girlfriend, who he'd recently broken up with, or perhaps another young lady from work. He tells his co-workers that if it's his ex-girlfriend, he'll marry her. Then, the day of taping arrives. The episode is titled, Secret Crushes. Now, which of these ways would you choose to reveal your secret crush on someone? A, would you write that person a letter? B, would you tell the person in private in case he rejects you? Or C, would you tell that person that you're gay and you hope he is on national television? <laughs> Two other secret crushes are revealed before Scott. Once they conclude, Donna and Scott are brought onto the set. Scott is optimistic. He's hopeful that Jonathan will reciprocate his feelings on the show, given such an elaborate expression of his affection. Now John, he, he knows you're gay, right? Yeah. Yes. Do, do you know that he is? No. Anything's possible. <laughs> they discussed Scott's secret crush on Jonathan, and Jenny extracts as many juicy details as she can from Scott. Meanwhile, Jonathan waits backstage in a soundproof room, unable to hear what's happening and awaiting his cue to come out for the reveal. Okay, you think about it, you, you have fantasies about him? I've had a couple, yeah. Yeah, you had one, you had, when he was under the car, you had a fantasy about him. Yeah, something to do with like brake oil, line snapping and... <laughs> and after a few minutes, it's time to call out Jonathan. John, and let's have John come out here oh, and right see now. who has the crush on him. Here's John. He initially sees his friend Donna. He's a little confused, but quickly figures out what's happening once he sees Scott. Jonathan appears to take the whole thing in stride. While possibly surprised, he doesn't appear angry or even shocked. Did you think Donna had the crush on you? Did I? No, we're good friends. Well, guess we're... what? It's Scott that has the crush on you. You lied to me. <laughs> Once Jonathan is settled in, they rewatch a clip of the statements Scott just made about his fantasies with Jonathan. Take a look at, we'll show a little playback of what uh, Scott said about you, uh, John. Take a look at that oh, monitor right here. there. I got a pretty big hammock in my yard, and I just, yeah, I thought about it. tying him up to my hammock. And? <laughs> well, it entails like whipped cream and champagne, stuff like that. <laughs> Did you have any idea that he liked you this much? Um, no. Well, you know, it's flattering, but... It's flattering, but you're not interested? There's no, no I mean, way. There's no way, right? No. no, but I am uh, definitely a heterosexual, I guess you could say. <laughs> the show continues, and toward the end, Jenny asks Jonathan how his relationship with Donna and Scott will be impacted by this encounter. He responded that it would not change, and that seemed to be true. At no time during or just after the show, did Jonathan appear to be angry in any way. He even encouraged Scott and Donna to change their flight to be on his flight, so he could drive them all home from the airport an hour-long drive once they got back to Detroit. They did, and everything was extremely amicable, both on the flight and the drive. And once they got back home, they all went out for drinks together at a local bar. The waitress recalled seeing them, and noted that they all seemed to be in a good mood. After they left, the three friends went back to Donna's apartment, and Jonathan claims that he left and went to his apartment two doors away at 2 a.m. But his whereabouts and actions that night would ultimately come under question, as we'll see in a few moments. But one thing is not disputed, and that is that at some point after that, Jonathan's attitude began to shift. The night before the murder, Jonathan had stayed over a female friend's house and crashed on her couch. When he arrives home the next morning around 10 a.m., he finds an orange blinking construction light, along with a note from Scott that reads, If you want it off, you'll have to ask me. P.S. It takes a special tool. And it's signed, Guess Who? After receiving the note, Jonathan decided that he would kill Scott Amager. Shortly after receiving the note, Jonathan left his apartment and drove his 1981 station wagon to the bank, where he withdrew over $300 in cash. 
He then drove to a hardware store and bought a box of 12-gauge shotgun shells, then to a gun shop where he purchased a 12-gauge shotgun. After assembling it, he drove to Scott's home. According to Scott's house guest, Jonathan was initially unarmed as he calmly confronted Scott about what Jonathan considered the sexually explicit note he received at the front door of his apartment that morning. He asks Scott if he wrote it. Scott acknowledges that he was the author. Jonathan then tells Scott that he left his car running and needed to shut it off and that he'd be right back. His roommate is also able to give a detailed account of what happened that morning. Scott was in the bathroom at that point, and when Scott came out and greeted him, they both walked down the hallway, and I continued reading my newspaper. And what did you notice next? Uh, he, the defendant came out and said uh, he had to shut off his car because he had left it running and, and left went outside. There was another knock. Scott went to the door. Scott opened the door and, I mean, he, he stood back from the door and picked up a chair that was near the door and said, Gary, help, he's got a gun. And at that point, the gun went off and there was a shot. And uh, I, I remember seeing Scott standing in the kitchen grasping his chest and falling to the floor. Having received two gunshots to his chest, Scott Amager dies. Oh my God. Oh, Scott. Scott, you're okay. Emergency 911. Please get someone here right away. My friend has been shot. Okay, what happened? Someone just came in with a gun and shot him. He don't know who it was? Someone that he knows. Okay, do you know who this person is? Can he give you the description? I only know his name is John. John, okay. Please hurry. Police arrive and Jonathan is arrested without incident. The Jenny Jones episode would never air. Public reaction to the murder was widespread. Blame for the murder was directed everywhere, including toward the murderer, the victim, and the Jenny Jones show. The show was quick to try to set the record straight. At the beginning of their next show, they added a special statement directly from Jenny, where she stated, As much as we all regret what happened, the fact is that this tragedy is about the actions of one individual. He was a guest on that show, and he, like every other guest on that show, was told he'd be meeting a secret admirer, and that guest could be a member of the same sex or the opposite sex. Jonathan Schmitz's trial began on October 14, 1996 in the Oakland County Courthouse. He was being charged with first-degree premeditated murder and felony firearm charges. Several speculations were explored during the trial. Given that early on, Jonathan showed absolutely no signs of being either humiliated or angry, many people speculated that those close to him may have convinced him that the encounter may call his own sexuality into question. And given what Donna stated during the taping of the show, that notion may have already been in their minds. Do you have any reason to think he is, Donna? I mean, um, not really. He, um, he said that his family kind of question him on it. Um, he's a very open person, so it really wouldn't surprise me. Adding to the suspicion that Jonathan was nudged toward his animosity was his father's own testimony during the trial, which hinted at his own attitude toward the scenario. I want to ask you a question, Mr. Schmitz, about one particular statement you made in that tape. And it's the following. Fathers thought the reason that he had to kill Scott Amateur is to prove that he was not homosexual. Remember saying that on the tape? I remember it was speculative thought. But the claim of an even more direct motive came up during the trial, when a friend of Scott stated that Scott and Jonathan had had a romantic encounter on the night they returned from Chicago and went drinking. The night that Jonathan claimed he left at 2 a.m. and went home. This didn't surprise members of the local gay community 
several of whom had reported to news organizations that Jonathan frequented the local gay bar scene in town. However, the Oakland County Sheriff's Department stated that it has no evidence that those allegations are true. And then, there were the advances. According to Jonathan, Scott had been making advances toward Jonathan since they returned from Chicago, the last of which being the note that triggered the murder. Jonathan's official account of why he killed was that his feelings toward Scott were not mutual and that Scott would not leave him alone. That he's gay, but I'm not. He said he wouldn't leave me alone, that's why I did it. He said I went on the Jenny Jones show. I didn't know it was a guy, that's why I killed him. While the trial was to determine the guilt or innocence of Jonathan Schmitz, it also explored the ethics of tabloid television, with blame regularly directed toward the Jenny Jones show, its sensationalism, and its exploitation of people and their vulnerabilities. Scott Amador's mother has said it over and over again. Jenny Jones put the gun in John's hand and she pushed him over the edge. But the Jenny Jones show would face their own, separate trial. So the prosecution attempted to keep the focus on the person on trial, the person who pulled the trigger. Their opening argument made clear that embarrassment is not a justification for murder. You cannot kill another human being for words spoken by that human being. Embarrassment is not an excuse for murder. Given that there was a confession and there was no way to claim that his defendant didn't perform the killing, the defense's only option was to claim that he was not in control of his actions. They claimed that it wasn't a murder it was a shooting. And because of Jonathan's depression and alcoholism, he wasn't capable of premeditation or responsible for the killing. They also asserted that during the television encounter, all he could think of was his grandparents and how they'd think that he himself must be gay if a gay person liked him. But their strategies were a reach given Jonathan's seemingly unaffected behavior for days after the taping. So between the diminished capacity claim blaming the show, and even blaming the victim, they were hoping something would stick. By the time the trial was over, jurors were shown and re-shown the footage from the show, listening to both sides' assessments and forming their own. Uh, definitely a heterosexual idea. After deliberating, the jury found Jonathan Schmitz guilty of the lesser charge of second-degree murder and guilty of the firearm charge. Then, the sentencing. I've considered everything that has been said by everybody. I have considered the law. I feel it appropriate, though difficult for me to do, that your sentence be a minimum of 25 years in state prison, maximum not more than 50 years. After the verdicts, the Jenny Jones show itself would go on trial. The family of Scott Amager filed a civil lawsuit against Warner Brothers and the Jenny Jones show, claiming that the show ambushed Jonathan Schmitz and didn't properly account for the potential outcome. They wanted them to take responsibility for what occurs after the shows. The Jenny Jones show's defense was that Jonathan Schmitz did not kill Scott Amager because of his experience on the show or any humiliation or anger that resulted, but instead that he killed Scott because Scott would not leave him alone. After only three hours of deliberation, the jury unanimously ruled in favor of Scott's family, awarding them over $29 million. But the show appealed and the decision was reversed, releasing the show of any responsibility. However, as a result of the verdict, the Jenny Jones Show implemented counseling before and after each episode. Other tabloid television shows also began reviewing their protocol, toning down the controversy and psychologically profiling potential guests. After the case was dismissed in 2002, the Jenny Jones Show's ratings dwindled and it was ultimately canceled the following year. After the amateur murder, there were other murders involving television guests, including Svetlana Orlova, killed by her ex-boyfriend after she rejected his on-air marriage proposal. And Nancy Campbell Panitz, killed just hours 
after an on-air confrontation with her ex-husband and his new wife. In September of 1998, the Michigan Court of Appeals overturned Jonathan Schmidt's second-degree murder conviction on the basis that his attorneys were denied the right to strike one of the jurors. He would get a brand new trial. So just three months after the Warner Brothers' Jenny Jones trial concluded, a new trial for Jonathan Schmitz would get underway. The max they could charge him with would be second-degree murder. And since the diminished capacity defense is not allowed in second-degree murder cases in Michigan, they could no longer rely on that defense. Even still, the defense hoped the jury would, again, hand down a lesser charge, which, in this case, would mean manslaughter. But they did not. This shorter, less publicized trial would end in the same verdict. Guilty of second-degree murder and a felony firearm. The prosecutor would reflect on how she felt there was more sympathy for Jonathan than for Scott. He would receive the same sentence of 25 to 50 years, plus two years for the firearm charge. Jonathan Schmitz was sent to Parnall Correctional Institution to serve his sentence. He was released from Parnall in August of 2017 at the age of 47. He just kept his post-prison life extremely private, but he was last known to live with his parents in Michigan, outside of Detroit. We can't help but notice that we're once again faced with someone who considers murder more attractive than the alternative. So in this case, the potential of being labeled a murderer was somehow more attractive than being labeled gay. We just don't get it. And we hope this video did justice to Scott Amager. There was a lot going on with this case. Do you think Scott and Jonathan were exploited by the show for entertainment? Or is Jonathan Schmitz solely responsible for his actions? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you like how we covered this case, please help us by hitting like. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss a single video.